this workshop is designed to, we, we, we Shannon and I thought about the, the overarching question of this workshop as um, how can we use bioacoustics to um, assess population structure? And when we say structure, we are talking about structure at kind of multiple levels. So for the geneticists in the room, don't think I mean populations in terms of kind of stocks or at that super low level. I'm, I'm talking about just a very generic sense of structuring and diversification. Um, and just to give an overview for people that haven't kind of thought about this issue, uh, we'll kind of just briefly touch on, you know, why we're interested in population structure and then why bioacoustics. Um, so we work for uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and which is in uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and we are um, controlled by two main mandates, pieces of legislation. That's the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, the Endangered Species Act is focused at a higher taxonomic level, species um, and distinct population segments, while the Marine Mammal Protection Act is focused at maintaining populations at a, at a lower level. Um, our group's main mission uh, is, has multiple components um, it's listed here, uh, assessing um, status of marine mammals, uh, estimating abundance, identifying uh, as units to conserve, life history kinds of questions, and um, we put that into an ecosystem context. Um, we are here looking at the identifying units to conserve, and that you know comes into play because we, in order to do these assessments, we have to know what units to apply them to. Um, and for marine mammals, that can be a, a difficult challenge. Um, this whole uh, collaboration with, uh, with Shannon that still makes me twitchy sometimes um, <laughs> came about, did I say that out loud? It, um, <laughs> so it just comes out sometimes. Uh, it came about um, because I was working on, um, on fin whale uh, stock structure and taxonomy. And in 2010, there was a, the agency had a review of, of fin whales and um, had to put together a recovery plan for the species, um, which was listed as in, endangered as are, are all of the whales on the endangered species list. And the idea is um, if we can do a status review, there's a potential that we can uh, downlist um, fin whales as either the species or, or as, uh, certain segments. Um, part of that is understanding some of the, um, the, the human mortality and, and understanding what the threats are, and, but the other component is understanding what the, the structure is. Um, the work started at a higher taxonomic level. Uh, currently, there's actually there's two primary subspecies for fin whales, one that's a little iffy. Um, a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere, and one of the iffy ones is in the southern hemisphere. Details we don't need to go into there. Um, my work initially was looking at this, at this taxonomy and, uh, and a asking the question, the initial question, um, really are, are North Atlantic and North Pacific fin whales the same subspecies? I mean, there's this big land thing in the middle and they're not likely to be breeding. So we, we had to sort of redefine the subspecies um, level. Um, but then when you go down to a, a lower uh, level of asking what, where the stocks are, that becomes more difficult. For fin whales, there are two recognized um, resident populations in the, uh, the Gulf of California and in the Mediterranean. And there have been genetic and acoustic differences seen um, in, within ocean basins and, of course, between ocean basins. Um, and traditionally, we've uh, used things like you know, geography, how they're distributed, um, genetics, morphology, um, life history, and you know, ecological adaptations. Um, but for a lot of these animals, um, a lot of these uh, lines are really hard to get data on. It's, it's really hard to sample fin whales. They are occur further offshore than uh, a lot of, than some of the, the more readily known whales. There's a lot of things we don't know about them. Um, so uh, we, we argue about this today. Either I went to Shannon or Shannon came to me and said, hey, what about acoustics? Um, I want to put the blame on her. It's her fault. 
Uh, and there have been there have been several comparisons uh, uh, between uh, different ocean basins, um, and we uh, said, well, can we use it within an, 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 an ocean basin uh, to uh, to look at, at at structure kind of below the subspecies level? And later on in my talk, I'll. I'll show you some of the, the work we've been doing with um, some of the recordings. We haven't totally answered that question, but, but part of that uh, has, is, is what has led to, to this. And I'll turn this over to Shannon from, from here. Because the word acoustic starts showing up more. <laughs> and that's her. Uh, OK. S so. Um, I, I only briefly mention what I do because you'll hear enough of me this morning. Um, but basically, I try to put acoustics to use for these management questions. But I've been um, doing this for almost 20 years, and I have yet to do biology. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so why bioacoustics? Um, so this is a, a little bit of a step back to just some basics about w the world that we are working with, with marine mammals. Um, it, if you imagine the environment, the sun is out in the s outside of the earth, way far away, and the sunlight hits the top of the ocean, and very, very little of it gets beyond the first few feet in the ocean. And once you get down to around 200 meters, there's really no light left. And so if you're an animal living in the ocean, light is probably not, and vision is probably not the most effective means of um, sensory for you. Uh, it's gonna be more of a near field thing. So vision um, is not as an important feature. It just so happens that sound travels extremely well in the ocean, much better than on land. And in the animals in the ocean, are, you know, they're smart enough, they've, um, a lot of them have adapted to this. Uh, in the marine mammals in particular, <coughs> uh, they've evolved a million different kinds of ways to take advantage of sound. They use it for finding food, for communication, finding a mate, pretty much you name it. <coughs> they've, uh, they've created a way to use sound for it. And these adaptations are pretty, pretty extreme. You've got blue whales who can uh, create stereotypes song in, in the tens of hertz, and these sounds can travel you know, across ocean basins. Uh, and then go up to the harbor porpoise, um, and small porpoise create a super high frequency narrowband clicks and <clears throat> uh, at the far upper range. And then these guys in the middle make the craziest sounds, everything you can imagine under the sun. And only a, a portion of this falls within our hearing range. <clears throat> So we've got um, a lot of stuff going on in the ocean, and it's, they use it for a lot of parts of their, um, their, for every life stage and for almost all behaviors. Another thing about the ocean is that it is a huge, huge part of the Earth. And the whole idea of like barriers to migration or things like that um, has a different meaning in the ocean. Uh, it's maybe more related to temperature and, or possibly ice cover, things like that. It's, it's just got a different meaning. And for an animal like the fin whale or the blue whale, you're talking in about an enormous distribution. Uh, so their, their entire habitat range for a stock, really, could be um, something that is actually a huge part of the earth. <laughs> so how in the world do you study this? But that's our job. <laughs> so uh, this is just a sampling of some of the work that I personally have been out. Um, I spent the first um, 10 or 15 years just going out to sea and really <laughs> having no life outside of that. And just this study area right here, we call this the Eastern Tropical Pacific, which I've done about six years of these studies alone. And um, that study area is about the size of Africa. So it's pretty ridiculous. And these smaller studies <laughs> still take four and a half months to survey. Um, 
so you can imagine if we have to try to understand, you know, our job is to understand their distribution, their abundance, their population structure, and we have to work in this kind of environment. Um, it's a little tricky. Uh, that's why <laughs> 20 years later, I'm still trying to figure it out, the basics. So on these surveys, um, the bulk of the work we do is based on visual observation. Uh, and out at sea, well, first off, you can't see at nighttime. So that cuts out half of, the, half of your time out at sea. But then when you have bad weather, when you have rain and fog, you can't see very far. So they have all these other limitations. So we've been adding acoustics onto our surveys to try to help. So to me, acoustics is just a tool. Um, it's a thing for t accomplishing a task or purpose. So we're trying to use animal sounds, you know, in this case to understand population structure, but also distribution, abundance, and all these other questions that we as NOAA fisheries need to answer. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of time doing hardware um, development and um, uh, some other methods development to try to <laughs> be able to do our job, <laughs> and I think I'm finally ready to actually dive into doing my job. Um, but, but then when we try to actually address these, we're talking about animals that we can't hardly ever see, we can't touch, it's illegal to approach them unless you have a permit. And, and so how are we going to apply um, our knowledge to population structure when we have very little knowledge? So ideally with other animals, with insects, with rats, with um, other animals that you can hold and you can look at a whole life cycle, uh, you would conduct controlled experiments to understand that connection between the animal sounds and what's going on with that animal, um, their behavior, their, uh, um, whether it's learned or innate, things like that. That's, that doesn't happen <laughs> in our field at all. Um, there are experiments with captive animals and experiments with wild animals, and we can learn from those. And we can, those are little bits and pieces. We are never going to have a blue whale in a tank and learn from them. That's just never going to happen. We have to assume for most of our species, that stuff will never happen. We can still learn from bottlenose dolphins, but it gets a little tricky to apply that to a blue whale. We can also learn lessons from other taxa, from the birds, from the frogs, and all the things that um, a lot of you guys study. And, and that's a large part of what we're looking for here, is what are the commonalities in the work that we are doing. And so if we work together to identify a unified approach based on those commonalities, um, lessons from other taxa, um, things, things that can work, and we can work together to kind of push that science forward. And, and so, you know, one of the things uh, is how do we apply it to, say, the example of the fin whale. Um, that's the example we're working on now. Um, I honestly thought we'd be done years ago. <laughs> but this is the, the thing that keeps coming back to haunt us. Um, in, and so we hope that we can learn a few lessons here, develop a few tools, methods, techniques to try to push this forward on species where we are never going to know all these things we need to know. But we have to use acoustics to answer these questions. These management concerns are really important. And um, if we don't bring information to the table, then there are you know, what do they have to rely on? Hundred-year-old whaling records or things like that. And it's really kind of hard to, um, to figure out what's going on today with the populations when all your data is from a hundred years ago. So acoustic stands to, uh, to really help us through that. And so that's, that's why we're here. We're hoping that we can um, learn from all of your diverse backgrounds and experiences and um, bring it together to find some common ground, develop tools and techniques to uh, kind of push the science forward. <laughs>